Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening um, to everyone. Awesome to have you here. Um, this is the fifth episode of the Stranded live stream. Um, and just dig straight in, I think. Um, as you've that, that watched this before, um, you know that we're doing them on Facebook nowadays and we're uploading the results uh, on our YouTube channel as well for posterity. Um, when we started these streams, um, we outlined a few different formats that, that you can see on the screen, although I'm, I'm blocking a few of them, I guess. And um, we are ticking these off um, one by one. Um, we did a public Skype lesson with Jack Gardner a few weeks ago. Um, I described some of our um, tremolo system last week. Uh, we did one where I designed a part and um, took your thoughts and, and feedback on that, which was very valuable and, and it will actually truly influence uh, our product design going forward. So um, what you said and, and commented during this stream made a difference. Um, and in between these live streams, you can send in uh, your suggestions to stranded at strandedguitars.com. And Armando um, Miraglia, Miraglia um, I should have checked uh, the pronunciation before, um, he got in touch a couple of weeks ago and said um, I thought I might propose an interview here and it would be great to talk to Per Nielsen. Um, and that's why we're here today. I have uh, Per and Armando standing by in um, a Skype window and um, we'll talk for a bit. Armando will talk to Per for a bit and then um, you can ask whatever questions you might have. Um, please use the, um, the comments field um, here and uh, we'll pick up some of your questions and uh, do our best to answer them live here on the stream. Um, so with that, um, we will have completed a lot of the formats for the show that, that we set out to do. Um, I am in discussion with the um, admin team, the, the group that is running our Spark program, and they have some amazing, amazing things in store um, that uh, blew my mind this morning, uh, everything that this community has, has produced. Um, it is just amazing, and I really can't wait to show it to, to all of you, and um, I'll invite some of the Spark uh, guys um, very soon to do this, um, most likely next week. But without further ado, um, I will bring in Per. Hello. I'm going to put on my headphones also. Whoa. Good. Now I can hear you. Yes. And hopefully everyone on the stream can only hear um, me once. So, Per, how is um, everything? Everything is well with the, with me and my family and everyone I know. So, so far, so good. Uh, we're, we're trying to keep ourselves quarantined. Uh, I haven't been able to see my beard dresser for a while, as you can see. It's like it's getting super unruly. But yeah. I guess it's yeah. I have a feeling that your son turned 10 months just a few days ago. A couple of days ago, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm spending a lot of time with him, of course, and, and also I'm doing a lot of work from my home studio. I, I, have a, I have a little setup right here where, where I'm sitting. So it's, it's nice. I'm having a lot of time with my new baby. This one is a bit younger than ten months, but awesome stuff. 
Well, um, I'm not going to steal Armando's thunder. So let's let's see if we can connect him. There we go. Yeah, hey, Armando. Hey, man, how are you? Good. Uh, really happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Sure. Uh, Thanks not, for getting not, in touch. Uh, it's not every day that you get to talk with Pat. <laughs> and, so and our, with you either. So. So Armando, you, you're uh, a member of the Spark community, and yeah. you're... I, I actually found out about it uh, recently. One of the oh. live shows introduced me to it. I didn't know about it, so that was pretty useful. Oh, that's awesome. And you're from Italy, but you actually live in Sweden. Yes. Uh, in, in Uppsala, as a matter of fact. In now. Uppsala. Yeah, that was, that was crazy, because you placed an order for a stand the other day, and we just noticed, look, this, this address is 200 meters away. So <laughs> <laughs> it seems silly to, to ship it. Um, right. so and that's the thing. With the guitar, you actually shipped it. <laughs> yeah. The guitar was shipped. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't be proactive all the time. I do. All right, good stuff. Um, I'm not going to say much more right now. I will instead hook the two of you up and um, let you go at it. So right. um, enjoy, have fun. Thanks. I guess we are on, I suspect. <laughs> yeah, man. All right. So I have done a little bit of research before to, to get prepared for this interview. So I, I want to start with a couple of questions about gear. Hope that's fine with you. So, if I understood correctly, uh, you were you first had something with Ibanez that went so ended, uh, and after that you got the opportunity to talk with Ula, and you started using the Strandberry products. Now, my question related to that is, what made you decide to stay with Strandberg as a Strandberry? Was it uh, some specific feature of the of the guitars? Was it the relationship with Ula? Uh, um, well, I, I was an Ibanez player for a long time, and I'm a I'm a big fan of their old guitar stuff that did in the late eighties and early nineties, especially the Steve I models. And I, I still have a few of those. So the gem. Yeah, I've got a few gems. In it, I don't play them all that much anymore just because I have, have them in storage. But I, I was a, an Ibanez player for, for a long while, and uh, and when I got the endorsement, I was like, that was a big moment for me. Uh, but eventually, you know, I started looking around at other bands, and you, you get curious, and you know, uh, you want to try to find the next big thing or, or whatever, you know? Uh, and uh, in 2013, I started going to the to the music fairs. I went to started going to NAMM and and Music Messe in Frankfurt, and uh, and I met Ola at the NAMM show in in California in early 2013, and I I got to try out guitars, and I I was really intrigued. They were they were so different than anything that I had. Ever played with the endorneck and everything? It was it was just so different. Still, it felt you know felt just like it made sense and and like I had uh, got the feeling like why it hasn't guitar guitars been like this like, all along? I still was a little bit and, and uh, it a little wild. But anyway, so I I, I, uh, I met Ola several times uh, and we started talking about making a guitar for me. Uh, Ola didn't he didn't you know he didn't uh, propose you know a partnership or endorsement or anything. He, he just told me that like he liked my playing and he said I I want to build you a guitar. And you know, with no strings. 
So, I hope so, at least. <laughs> yeah. So, and I and I started that. It's possible to make a slower finish, and I have 27 friends, which means I have on the first day of that. And I have two gentlemen. And all of us, sure, I basically, you know, he wanted to make me the guitar of my dreams. Uh, and he built me the first prototype, and uh, you know, my jaw was in the floor. Uh, that's just one of the most amazing guitars I've ever played. And, and I was like, yeah, I'm probably gonna retire all of my other guitars. So in, in a sense, in a sense, the advantage that you, that you had so far is that you got to really personalize the product for yourself. Yeah, you know, I got the guitar that I want. You know, so for stuff that, that that's gonna be too hard to implement, or that's gonna be you know too expensive or whatever. It's just nothing was really impossible. And also, we, you know, we, we hit it off on the personal level, you know, we hang out and, and we're good friends and, you know, we stay in touch. And I, I live like an hour from, from all us. And I can, I can go back right. to the topic. So I think it needs to be, you know, big for, uh, for whatever. So it's like, uh, it's, it's nice on many levels. And, uh, and I think, no, I, I could never, if, even though, you know, uh, Ibanez were really good for me and they kind of did great things at the, at the time, they wouldn't have, you know, I, they wouldn't have uh, been able to do all these things for me. And, uh, and at the same time, you know, I, I, grew, I grew up with, with the Strandberg guitars. And nowadays, especially with my new model that I'm holding right now, where, where we you know, make some of the changes sort of uh, grew in my mind through these years. Uh, especially now when I have this part, it's like all, almost hard to, be, to, be, to go back to. Uh, uh, sorry for breaking in. It's the audio is getting pretty bad. And Ar Armando, are, are you hearing everything okay? So, so. But yeah, I, I can't. So, I can't follow, but not great. So yeah. I don't know if you can get the maybe the microphone closer to you. Yeah, that might help. Uh, let me see if I maybe if I use yeah. it. Yeah, because when 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 you're when when you're closer, when you were leaning forward just now, <laughs> it sounded pretty good. Right. Quite. It's, it's good. It's good enough. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, you could probably find some happy medium there. I'll le uh, leave you to it. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm finding a happy maximum. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask you another thing, which is, again, gear-related, uh, a little bit more historical. So I'd imagine you started with six strings. Am I right? Yes. Right. So, and then you move on to seven, and nowadays it's seven and eight. Now, my question is: first, why did you switch from six to seven, seven to eight? Uh, what were the reasons for doing so? And the second is: how did you find it? Was it difficult? Did it take long? Did you get accustomed to it? And then the third question about it is: if I were to tell you you have to choose one guitar, what kind of guitar would you get? Six, seven, or eight, right. or more? I mean, when I started playing guitar, uh, it was in the mid 80s, so there weren't any commercially available electric guitars back then. So six string it was, and uh, and then in uh, like 93 or 94, uh, I, I was a big Steve I fan, and he had, he had his seven string, and one day I was in a, uh, I was passing by in, in Sundsvall, you see the northern Sweden, and I went into the, their music store. Uh, I, I was just passing by, so it was just like a chance thing. And they had a, an Ibanez Universe uh, in there, and I actually had an, an Ibanez uh, gem. Well, I, I had the, the, the black gem with, with green pickups and the green uh, 
fine on the fretboard. And and the seventh string was a, a black one with green pickup. You know, it was like sort of the same model, but so they had the seventh string, and and when I saw it, I was like, you know, oh my god, I couldn't believe it. It's a seventh string out out in the wild, and it's it's for sale. But I I asked them, you know, to, to trade in my guitar. I got to call the phone and call up my dad. Like, hey, can you transfer some money? It's, it's super important. So that's when I started playing seven string in my and. Uh, that was, uh, it wasn't super difficult, but it took some time to get accustomed. For me, it was when you play the, when you play the treble strings, it's easy because you can, you, I mean, you have the, the end of the, of the neck. You, you have the first uh, string to orient your thing. And when you're on the bass string, it's, it's vice versa. You, you can. But when you're in the, like the middle string, so C and A and G string, that's where I had to look. Where where am I? I got lost. It wasn't that difficult, and I it quickly became you know my weapon of choice instead of I played it in the band of bands. And then uh, well, fast forward to when Ibanez uh, started producing their first uh, production model. They sent me one, and uh, I messed around with that, but I, I didn't really like it. I, I liked the set of strings, but the, the eight string was, was like too bulky, but too heavy. It just didn't feel like I was playing a guitar, and it's a big thing, and I can't, I can't play lead. Just, so I, I played it sometimes like, out of curiosity but it, it wasn't it wasn't an instrument for me it starts to be a little bit too wide what's that so the neck starts to be a little bit too wide it's a bit too wide and you know the scale length it was bigger i think it's a 28 on that one or 27 if you remember but it, it felt too big uh but i didn't enjoy it too much so it wasn't until some years later, when I got the call from Meshuga to, to start playing with them, that I, you know, where I actually had to start playing. Now, now there's no get around, getting around it. So when I got the call, the, the, I didn't even call my wife. The first first guy I called, you know, was uh, Ola. <laughs> Something came up. So it was, it was kind of important. Can you make me an eight? So, so it, Ola sent me a, a golden eight. That I could have to, to, to get started with, uh, and then uh, you know, in time uh, he he built me the, the first prototype of Cinderella, and uh, the Bodenate was was nice. It was definitely a, a step up for my, my Ibanez eight string, uh, but still there were some things with the neck that still was a little bit too bulky for me, so. With the prototype uh, that uh, Strandberg made, with the neck being thinner, uh, then it started, you know, to really make sense for me. Uh, and it felt like it felt like it wasn't that much of a step up from from playing a seven string in in right. terms of uh, you know playability. Uh, and and I mean I have it, it's it's a multi scale so. 26 and a half on the treble, treble side and 28 on the bass side, so it's it's a little bit easier to the, the, the difference for playing leads is it's not as big, right. but you you you, you have the the, uh, the good stuff about having the, the long scale for the bass string. So so with the with the singularity eight and especially now the the new prototype we have done where the neck profile is even more. You know, uh, tuned to the uh, It's really not that big of a difference playing the seven or the eight. Right, I mean, because the, the, everything's still bigger, of course. But, yeah. Because the and new I, model now has exactly so the the production model has the neck that is uh, tailored for you. Well, it's not a production model yet. Okay. It will be. 
I'm, I'm not I'm not sure at this point whether the eight string will become a production or not. I don't, I don't know. We haven't sorted everything out. Uh, the, the seven string is looking to be a production, but that's cool. Uh, right. But but yeah. Uh, but if I if I was to choose a guitar, you know the if I get stranded on an island with the only one guitar, uh, it would it would be a seven string and it would be sure. it would be the plan. So I have to find the opportunity if, to try one. In an eight string. I play an A string with Meshuga. I, I, I really prefer to play the, the seven string. It's, uh, it's, it makes more sense for what I do. Fair enough. Uh, another question I have now, we go more into the playing side of things. Sure. So you, you have had in your history uh, pretty significant injuries. Uh, so arms and hands. Now I'm wondering, especially because I'm a, a, a beginner, so I, I am uh, noticing the difficulty of making sure that practice doesn't become too much mm-hmm. and balance that. So I'm wondering, considering that, do, what do you do nowadays to avoid injuries again? Or do you do anything at all? Uh, no, I, I don't really do anything. You know, what, what I don't do is I, I, don't, I don't play until my arms hurt. Because when I, when I was... Especially when I was in my teens, I, I played, you know, every minute I, I could. And, and you know, when you're a teenager and you don't have you don't have the, all the responsibilities of of a grown up, uh, you can spend all the time. You know, I I skipped school just to, to play guitar. Even though I went to like a music school, I just anything I didn't want to do at the time, I just skipped and I practiced guitar. So there were some days where you know I played for 16 hours. Not every day, some days. I just played like crazy. And when I didn't play, I was sitting down and maybe you know, I, I was arranging four part harmony or something. So I was still using my hands. It, it was really stressful, and that's what ended me up with the hand and arm. Part. And uh, you're young and you're stupid. Right. And <laughs> nowadays, you know, I, I wouldn't. I would never, you know, dream of playing guitar for 10 hours straight. Really. But I, I guess that when I was young, I got enough practice in so so that I, you know, I, I got in like a base level of technique that I, I, I'm I now coasting on. And I, if, I, if I just, you know, keep playing a bit, Every now and then, I, I can keep the technique up, sort of. Right. So the delta is of keeping that technique going is smaller, which means you need to practice less. Yeah. And, and nowadays, I I don't even, you know, I don't practice anything. If, if, I, if I'm learning, like, a new song, a new Meshuggah song or something, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing. I, I may, might, you know, play some of the harder riffs. I play to a metronome for a bit. Uh, but other than that, I, I don't, you know, I don't shed scales and 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 work work and stuff like that. I, I just I just play. Right, That's especially so now thinking about Meshuga, so especially so I'm thinking when you have a gig going on with Meshuga. So do you do anything beforehand before starting to go crazy on, for example, bleed where you have to really be really hard and move a lot or do you do any sort of warm-up before or you just go there and straight up well b- before a show or even before we rehearse uh, I don't I don't have a, 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 a warm-up regimen or anything I, I just you know play maybe I, I just play something nice and slow you know just to keep my my hands on the fretboard uh, and loosen up a bit but it's it's not like I'm stretching and then I'm doing a series of things. And uh, for a song like like Bleed, that it's so taxing to play. Usually, when we start rehearsing for a tour, we might start like a month before a tour start. And uh, often it's like uh, maybe the, the previous tour was half a year ago or something. So 
no one in the band has been playing the songs since. So right. usually when, when we most most of the songs are, are easy enough to play, you know, we, we can get through them on the first rehearsal. But when we come to bleed, it's like we stop playing it, and after thirty seconds, someone is just like Thomas is throwing his drumsticks, or someone is screaming and kicking with it. I'm like, ah, stop! I can't play anymore. Ah, fuck me! <laughs> <clears throat> and then and then the next day we can do fifty minutes, fifty seconds of it, and the next day you hop on the song. You progress over time. All right. <clears throat> Another question I had is always staying on the playing side. So considering a beginner like me, what would you suggest or what would you recommend for evolving in the guitar journey? So from your point of view, what would, what's important what to keep in mind to, to work on? Uh, to actually, you know, to actually play, to actually play music and to play real stuff, preferably get together with people. Yes. And, and play with other people. And you you can also find good backing tracks and, and jam along to but if you if you're just sitting with a metronome and uh, you know working on, on details and technique and stuff, that's that's good and that's really you know that's the you need that as well if you want to reach a certain level. But as early as possible, you should get together with some people and and, and yeah. So you have to you have to put everything you, that that you practice on your own. You have to you know put that into a real real life experience as soon as possible. Right. I mean I mean I I started playing in bands before I could play them. My my first band. Uh, was called Cobruna, the Cobra. And, uh, I was like, I was, I was ten. I had started learning a, a few chords, but I couldn't really play a lot. And we had a friend of mine. He played pots and pans because we hadn't had we had we didn't have any drums. I actually had an electric guitar uh, uh, through an app, but he played pots and pans. And we had a guy who, who sang, and he didn't have the microphone, so he just took whatever. And, and everything we played was improvised. I, I have a set somewhere of, you know, 90 minutes set of just improv se- an improv session. But at some point, I, I hope to uh, recover that tape, see if it's still worth it. Maybe, I, maybe there's some cool ideas. And uh, right. there's, a, I, there's a riff that I remember. I played it on all England's uh, uh, internet uh, show. Yeah. The, one of the first riffs I ever wrote, and it goes like this. Good sure. enough. And uh, maybe someday I'll I'll put that into a song. Exactly. I'm still waiting for that. Uh, I've seen the interview, so exactly, <laughs> I'm waiting for that. <laughs> if it's like orchestrated and you know, write some something nice, it might, might actually you know work. It, it, would, it would be nice to like tie my whole is like a circle that you know, full circle. Right. If I don't know if I still have some time, but uh, I have a couple of questions more. Sure. All right, perfect. I'm not then, gonna... Oh, great. <laughs> so uh, I actually had a question that popped up to my mind based on the interviews you have done. Where it's, So if I understand correctly, you're basically improvising all the time in your head, in a sense. If you hear, uh, if you hear something, you're improvising uh, straight up something in your head uh, and try to sort of ma- mix and match things. So I'm wondering... And, and I guess that's basically improv uh, on the go. And I'm wondering of that improvisation that you do, uh, both on the guitar or in your head, how much of that is grounded in in theory, and how much of that comes from pure sheer creativity and experience? Uh, I guess everything is grounded. I don't know if it's grounded in theory, but. So like I, I you know I haven't 
internal internal representation of of everything I play. So if I'm sort of thinking about melodies, if I sort of improvise in in in, in my imagination, you know, I I can see the notes played out on a guitar and on a fretboard or or on a keyboard. Uh, so I have an internal representation, and I you know I if I hear a melody, I can hear you know, the chords that go under it or the chords that could go under it. Uh, it's, it's like, it's hard to separate. I, I remember when I was young and I started learning theory, uh, there was a bit, you know, was a, for a while there, a couple of years, uh, whenever I heard music, it, it, was, it was really hard to not, you know, analyze things. It was not. It was hard not to be like, oh, what's what's going on there? Oh, it's a flat uh, seven, or you know. Uh, but eventually, that went away, and I guess that is, you know, because a lot of the theory stuff, you know, got so, you know, were, I, I had it so down, you know, so I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to, you know, make a conscious uh, effort. Right, so you, you basically reach the point where you internalize theory so much that it just becomes part of your expression. Yeah, because it's like it's 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 the language I speak, and it's like everyone has an internal monologue in in their head, and probably a, a lot of us uh, have it all the time. Some people have a you know very negative monologue, like I suck, I suck, I'm horrible, I'm ugly, and other people they are like, oh, I'm the best, I'm so awesome. Uh, maybe you, you should be a, like a little bit in between. But then, anyway, I, I think that's a little bit what what I what I have, and I'm sure a lot of musicians have the same thing. So it's like the internal monologue I have. That's, aside from from you know uh, thoughts that words, I also have the music of thought. And this is very interesting because actually I always compare music and learning the guitar, learning music theory and everything to learning a new language. Yeah. So theory is basically like learning the grammar rules and then you learn to speak. It's like they are not necessarily one uh, against each other. They can compensate each other. You can learn bits and pieces and then put them things together and when things click, you can just speak. And you learn a new language, so it's very interesting that you actually have that that point of view. That's yeah, and and when you don't know a language well enough, uh, I mean, I I speak English reasonably well, but sometimes you know I, I have to make a pause because I was like, uh, you know, how how to, you know, what what's the cor correct uh, uh, word or whatever, you know, what's the correct grammar for for, for this uh, or whatever. Uh, so, I, so I, I don't have you know English down as well as I have music, music, the language of music. Uh, Fair so it hinders me a bit, but I'm not as hindered in, in music. And also, uh, 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 another like similar analogy would be, you know, where you, where you talk, like I'm doing now. This is improvisation. I'm improvising. Yes. Uh, and if I if I'm writing you a letter or an essay, it's composition. And to me, that's a bit, a bit, it's a bit the same. And uh, when I when I speak English, uh, I I can I can really I can compose things well because I write English really well. And it's like almost flawless grammar wise. But when I talk, it's uh, it's not really there. And some of the pronunciation sometimes it's it's, it's a bit bad. And and I have. I take my time to speak, you know, sometimes I'm like quiet for a bit like that. Right. So, so yeah, so on the in I think it's really similar to the music, to the guitar. And like I was talking to this with some Berkeley students yesterday, um, that uh, I find that improvisation and composition is like, it's the same thing, it's just different time scales. It's like improvisation is it's like instant. It's like instant composition. And composition is like frozen improvisation. Interesting. Interesting. 
And uh, if if I may, uh, what would you suggest? Uh, what what kind of? So it's, probably it's very personal. But what, what kind of process did you go through to get this visualization visualization going? Was it just uh, organic that it came, or did you do something specific to get it developed? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm the kind of person who. You know, when I get interested in, in something, I have a hard time thinking about anything else. Uh, and uh, mu- music is obviously like, like my main thing, but sometimes, you know, I, I'm interested in, in uh, cooking food. So something, sometimes I'm like, on Saturday, I'm going to make a big chili. Then I can't, can't think about anything else. I'm fantasizing about the kind of ingredients. And, I'm, uh, and for, with music, that's been like a really big thing for me. When I was young, and I when I really started getting into practicing, playing scales and uh, you know, doing all the wood setting. When I when I wasn't able to play guitar, you know, when I was riding the bus to school or something, you know, I couldn't pull up my guitar and sit in the bus. People would look at me. Then I had to you know go to my you know, my real comfort zone in my right. head, and, I, and then I could see you know, the, the fretboard, I could see the the notes and the fingers walk, walk and, you know, and, and then try to figure out, okay, so I did that, what, what if I play that in MIDI and then I try to envision it and hear it. And so I guess it grew from there. Right. So personal interest and, and uh, passion and motivation, basically. Yeah, and I mean, I've, I've, I'm sure a lot of other people are doing the same thing and have the same experience, but I, I can't, you know, Look into anyone who says, right. Right, right. Uh, I still have a last question, gear related, uh, which relates to so the fact that, for what I understand, you generally uh, use uh, multi effects de- uh, devices like Helix, uh, Axe Effects, and, th- and those things. And I'm wondering how do you shape the tones that you need out of those? So what kind of process do you go through to build up a patch that you're happy with? Well, uh, when I when I got the the HX tones from Line Six, I'm using those with with scar symmetry and nocturnal rights. Um, I I went through all the the factory patches. And you know, I wrote down which, which ones that I that I liked the most, and you know, made a like a shootout between them until I find the, found the one that that I liked the most. So I I started with that one, and then I just you know tweaked it. I don't I don't really have you know much of a process. You know, I I, I, I know what my ears like, and you know, I, I know that for a deep tone, I. I want to have a bit of stereo delay and some reverb, and I, I, I don't want, want it to be too busy. So I can't be mindful of any extra fits or the harsh frequencies, but yeah, I, I don't have a much of a process. In a sense, you basically describe the process because the sense is like you go through, okay, start with the patch, and then you start. Yeah shoot out as of which patch makes sense and then start to tweak it so that it sounds better to you. Then again, that, that's what I did with the HX Tom. Uh, I, I use a lot of software when I record. Almost all the recordings I do is, uh, is uh, software, like plug into my door. I've been using a lot of the new old DSP stuff. They're, they're like the lead of the pack right now uh, with, with AMP simulation. Uh, and with with their plugins, I, I tend to never try out the, uh, the the factory factory patches. Not that they're not good or anything. It's just uh, yeah. Some, maybe maybe it's something about uh, having the graphic interface on, on the computer where you can see all the everything. And their plugins are they are you know very intuitive and you, you can see the amp. You know, so it's like you going up to the amp and you, you tweak. We right. Com- com- compared to actually dealing with the little manual where you have to go back and forth and, and so on and so forth, there you basically have everything in a much easier user interface. Makes sense. Yeah. So, and, and if I tried some other device, 
maybe I would do it some other way. So so in a way, I, I don't have a I don't have a process, but. It's like for I, I, I'm pretty particular about about what kind of stuff I want for the you know, It has to have you know it has to be a, have to have a like singing mix. You know if it's if it's, if it's too scooped in the midst it, it won't work. It's you know it has to be it has to be have that singing quality. And right. then I I I like to have you know quite a bit of uh, time time based effects like. Stereo delay and reverb. Sometimes I like to have you know like stereo chords with some stereo phaser to to help spread it out because uh, I don't really like when you have a lead tone that's when you can when you can feel like the core of the tone is just like a, a mono tone and then you can hear the effect being a stereo. If you can feel like the core of the tone is is just like tiny little mono sound right. that I don't like that. I was one of that nice, nice spread. Right. There's different ways to, to get. Interesting. Well, I have gone through all the questions I prepared. <laughs> Thank you so much, and sorry it took so long. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much, Armando. Um, I think um, I enjoyed hearing um, everything you talked about. Um, I hope everyone online did the same. And uh, as I said in the beginning of the stream, um, Armando got in touch through our email, stranded at strandedguitars.com, and proposed to do this interview, and it happened. So um, I suggest if, if you have a similar interest, um, nominate yourself for an interview, and uh, we can do more of these over time. But for now, um, we'll let you go, Armando. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. Then. So, Pear, good stuff. Um, I want to reflect over one thing um, that you guys discussed, which which was about um, fatigue and, and how much you practice. Um, remember a few years ago, I had developed this, uh, this app that uh, measured the tension in your forearm. Um, it was based on, on this device that, that could measure, um, it was originally designed to be like wrapped around your arm and you could do gestures uh, to like flick through pages in a service manual when your hands were dirty. That, that was like the use case. But I used it to actually measure the tensions in your arm as you were playing to, to uh, visualize the differences between the endure neck and the conventional neck. And you got to try it out. And we could hardly measure the tensions in your arm because your light, your touch was so incredibly light as you played. Uh, so I would imagine that you've just practiced enough that you will never suffer injury again because your technique is so good. Uh, is th th does that make sense? Uh, maybe I don't know. <laughs> I actually have a, I have a question here uh, from Kaushik. Uh, I think he's he's reflecting on when you said that when you were younger you would practice for sixteen hours uh, a day. Like, what was your practice schedule at that time uh, what kind of exercises did you go through to like fill up an entire day um, well uh, as it told, uh, it told you about the uh, of getting the seven string the steam vinyl how about the oh, your, your audio is terrible again terrible hello yeah <laughs> better if I can come up close I actually think that is better <laughs> Well, um, I was a big Steve Vai fan, uh, and uh, he had like he was featured in if it was Guitar Play or Guitar World with his like ten hour guitar workout, and that that just like it it, it, uh, it something within me like that's what I want to do you know, because I had the idea at the time that you know I, I was. Uh, I was gonna try to be you know, the best. 
a player ever or something. You know, if you're young and you're stupid and your your ego is all over the place. So Steve I he had the, the ten hour workout and I think he had like divided it up in, you know, hour chunks. Uh, or if it was like, you know, practice fifty minutes and take ten minutes off. Something something like that. So that's what I did. So I structured it like that. Uh so I, I had like one hour of uh, I never played, you know, for a full hour. I tried to play for fifty to five minutes and then, you know, have a toilet break or go for a smoke or something. Uh, so I had like one hour of alternate picking and then one hour of sweet picking and then maybe I took an hour to to write some fourth part harmony, like that's the counterpoint fourth part harmony. Uh, and then I went back and did in, like, in, improv like uh, o- over something for an hour, um, and yes, I just kept at it like that. And and also there was a big chunks of time where I also was was just was just playing and not maybe not practicing focus practice. Maybe I was like, watching a movie and having my car in my lap and, and was just noodling and sometimes music started playing in the movie and I, I jammed along to that. <laughs> you know, just played quietly and, and listened to the dialogue. So, so but it, it, it sounds it like... that hours of focus practicing, but it was 10, 10 hours of play. Yeah. But it sounds like it was it, it was still pretty structured then and, and with, with a clear uh, goal in, in mind of... It was of I, working I changed, on different things. Change things up, you know, on week eight. Change things up what, what I wanted to work on. And yeah. uh, in time, I, you know, I started learning a new scale. I put that to the schedule as well. But sometimes I could have you know, a week of the Orion, and that, and when I, when I I guess it's time to lean forward again into your microphone. <laughs> yep. Uh, then it was like all arpeggios from the Dorian mode. Yeah. And then I did improv and it was all Dorian. But I, I sometimes I, you know, focus everything on certain things. Yeah. But uh, uh, so a follow-up question also from from Kaushik. Did, did did you practice over all twelve keys, or did did you have a, f- a favorite key to to practice and eventually compose or or improvise on? I I tried to play in the key. Also, you know, the, the band played in you know for you know when you play guitar based stuff, you you're often the uh, Playing with E and with A. You don't play in B, 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 or or in B. Uh, but I also, school I went to, to play a lot of music, even though I was never up too much. Audio is terrible right now, Pear, I'm afraid. Shit. Uh, try, try. If, uh, oh, hold on for a few seconds. I'll okay. Try so fingers crossed that we can um, get some improvement on the uh, audio here. No. I think try try to just speak louder, Per. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Louder. Yeah, yeah. Louder. <laughs> and my my son is trying to eat in the baby room. 
right. Yeah, it seems we're not having a ton of luck right now. That's Skype for you. Um, actually, let's let's do this. Uh, we'll just hang up the Skype, and I'll dial you in uh, again. See if that makes a difference. Hang on, just a sec, everyone. Hello. But this is much better. This is much better because I I changed to my to my phone. Awesome stuff. Yep, because I was using the laptop and yeah. All right, amazing. Um, I think yeah, you were you were still talking about the uh, if, if if you improvise or improvise over, over all 12 keys, or if, if you had a favorite. Uh, I think we're uh, kind of in the middle of that. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah so so what, what I was saying, if you could hear me, I don't know. Uh, whenever I played like with friends, with other guitar players, we played in guitar keys, you know, like E and A, the stuff that you want to play when you play guitar. Right? Uh, but also in, in the school I went to, we played a lot of jazz tunes where, where you play them in like horn keys, like uh, F and B, B flat and E flat. And, uh, so I, I, you know, I was forced to to play in the weird keys as well. Uh, and w when I practiced, you know, I, I made also made an effort to to play in different keys. And uh, one thing I did when I when I practiced uh, improvisation. Uh, for for example, if I if I, I was working on playing, uh, imp improvising over the Dorian mode, I could make a, you know come up with a, a Dorian progression, uh, with all Dorian keys. You could be like, start in E Dorian, then go to B flat Dorian, you know, big leap, and then go to C sharp Dorian, uh, F sharp Dorian. So, you know just move move the key center around but everything is is in dorian uh, and i tried to make that you know like as random as possible and then i i improvised over it you know playing staying in each key center for like two bars or something uh, and anytime when when the key cha key center changed uh, wherever i was in my improvisation i tried to you know go from the last note in that key, key center to the closest note in the next key center and try to play ideas that, you know, could flow over the, the key changes. Uh, and, and that was really helpful to, you know, like try to randomize, uh, randomize things and, and force myself into, into places that, you know, you may be, maybe you wouldn't, uh, come across them in in music that you play in songs that you do work on but how, how how much formal training do you have in in music theory and how much are you self-taught uh, i mean it's a bit of both uh i i went to uh, the music gymnasium which is like uh high school or something uh you know, between your 16 and 19, I went to music school. But before that, I also took took some theory lessons when I was younger. But I learned a lot of theory in between I was 16 and nine, 19 or 20. And then a couple of years later, I, I went to to another music school for a year where I studied with a, a guy called Alvaro Isrojas, who also happened to be, he was the, like the head theory teacher at the, at the Royal uh, royal, uh, like what do you, what do you say? Royal, royal uh, University of uh, of Music in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was a theory badass, and he taught me a lot of things. I also took improvisation lessons from him. But aside Wait. from that, it's more you know. I also you know have a was curious about things, so I I've been learning a lot of on my own. 
But you don't you don't obsess over gear and, and technology in, in the same way. Do, do you like with digital modelers, you can change the virtual tubes and you can move the virtual microphone in front of the cone. Do, do you get into that? Do, do you obsess over details like that? That, that are I mean it's kind of equivalent to all this music theory at least in my mind yes I mean I like for things to sound good you know and I I I also you know I, I mix my own things my own albums and I, I do yeah. some some mixing stuff for for other people uh, but it's like the the advent of 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 the DAW, DOS, and uh, and you know all the plugins you have. That's that's been really good for me because I I can use all these sounds and all this all this processing without having to you know do any you know hands-on engineering stuff. You know I I could I I couldn't you know, like solder anything or I, I I don't like that. I don't I don't enjoy that part of it. You know I I can't. I can't set my guitar up properly. You know, I've never adjusted a truss knob, so I, I don't like stuff like that. But sitting yeah. in front of my computer and and I can you know can move around the virtual microphone on a on a on a cab, I enjoy that very much. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't obsess about it. I, I just want it to sound good. And if I if I try a virtual cab out and I can't make it sound good, I just toss it away and, and I try the next one. Until I find something that sounds good enough, I, I'm I'm not like, oh, is is this uh, V30s? Is this is this, is this Greenbacks? You know, I, I don't care yeah. too much about you know. What you're not hanging on. Uh, you're not hanging on internet forums and and like finding out the the ultimate. Not really. Tab. And I mean, <laughs> I've, I've got friends who are, they know everything about the difference in you know between different sort sorts of uh, power amp tubes and. And how yeah. to bias an amp, and they know how everything, all of that works. I I don't want to know. <laughs> you know, if if someone if someone could like matrix the information into my head, that would be awesome. But <laughs> I don't I don't have time for that. I've got too much music <laughs> in my head. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, a couple of people have asked when Phase Two Cenotaph will be out. Yes. Uh, Mike is asking, and someone else was asking too. Yeah, people have have been asking me for the past like four years or so. So <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I still don't have a release date. Uh, I'm actually still uh, doing some work on it. Uh, right now, uh, our other guitar player Benjamin Ellis is working on his lead parts in his studio in the UK. Uh, and I'm working on recording my leads here in my little quar quarantine studio. Uh, and aside from the leads and uh, some odd uh, uh, like backing vocals, uh, only the mixing remains. So, so I'm I'm get getting there slowly. So hopefully <laughs> before this year is 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 over. But I've said I've said that previous years. So I, I don't want to make too much promises. Yeah. And I think that is one of the areas that you do take also very seriously, though, uh, mixing and, and um, the, the engineering of the album, since since you do that yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want for, for things to sound good. And I want for the stuff I record, the music I write, I want it to be, you know, represented the way I want it to be represented. And mm. when we did the, the the previous album, at first I I, I didn't ex I didn't think I was going to mix it, but I started, you know, I I had a decent, you know, like working mix for for recording. Yes, I I had a decent mix going, but then I sent off tracks for for one song to a few mix engineers, some, some people who don't do great work, but. When they sent me, you know, their first uh, mix, even though it sounded really good, maybe better than mine, I, uh, but it was clear that they didn't interpret the music, you know, the way I wanted to hear it, with with all the layers I do, 
so I, I just realized that for, for what I do, I, I needed to to see the songs through myself. Uh, because sometimes on certain tracks, it, it can be like, you know, 20 tracks of keyboards and uh, there's four rhythm guitars and there's drums and bass and there's 20 tracks uh, of vocals at the same time. And there's all these things and I want everything to, you know, sort of come out in the mix and uh, and sometimes have stuff that it's not supposed to, you know, pop out too much. So then it's it was easier to do it myself, even though it's, it's like really time consuming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everyone is looking forward to um, the next album very much. Um, there's several more comments here from um, eagerly awaiting fans. Yeah. Hey, thanks for waiting, everyone. And I'm, <laughs> as always, I'm very sorry. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, things things do take time, um, and I think it's generally better to to do it well and and take that time that that it takes, and uh, it's usually worth it in the end. Yeah. But um, with that, let's see. There's uh, last question. I was gonna say let's wrap up because the time is up. But one last question popped up um, during these Corona times. How about pair record some scar symmetry slash Mushuga slash Kaipa cover covers on your YouTube channel? I think that would be in- very interesting. Yes, I sort of agree, and I've been thinking about you know recording. Maybe like a couple of scar symmetry solos, uh, especially since we 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 don't tour that much, and people might be interested in you know seeing what I do uh, and not just hearing it. But as uh, I'm already so late with with the album and other stuff I want to do, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it's all also that. Uh, when I whenever I post something on YouTube, it's 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 uh, and I mean I I do that so sporadically, and when I post something, it's it's because it's something that I felt like doing at the, at the time. Uh, I pick up my guitar and then I'm like, oh, now I have a tone that and I that it's nice, and then I record it and put it up. So there's not a lot of thought around it, uh, and and recording a cover of uh, one of my own solos, for example, would it, that that would take more pre-planning which I don't like as much <laughs> and also I don't think I would want to do a, a I would feel weird about doing a Meshuga cover because it's like it's like I'm sort of you know I, I play live with them so I sort of in the band uh, so it's weird to do a cover but also you know it's yeah it would feel weird it's like uh, come come out to the show instead yeah well Per thank you very very much Armando um, thank you very much for nominating yourself to do this um, interview Um, I think it was a screaming success uh, aside from some audio issues Um, we learned that that switching to a mobile might uh, make a difference and everyone that's watched the ish- the episodes before this live stream know that we're really just figuring out figuring things out as as we go along and and try to learn and and improve. Uh, I know one learning for me is to have some kind of monitor above the camera uh, because I'm trying to look into the camera and not seeing what Perry is doing. But um, that's fine. We'll be better next time. So. Uh, signing off thank you everyone that's been watching and uh, tune in next week we'll have something interesting for you at that time cheers <laughs>